There are few centers of excellence in science and engineering which exceed uh, ISRO, certainly in India, and, and it can be said in, in most parts of the world. ISRO has excelled in um, homegrown technology, frugal technology. It's got an incredible vision, and it's got um, a real sense of hope uh, backed by a solid ability to achieve. Um, when we're talking about frugal achievement and frugal engineering, the cost of the Mangalyaan mission uh, is less than what a major Hollywood film actually spends in terms of the overall production. And that's just one example. Now, ISRO over a period of time has excelled in satellites, they've excelled in rockets. In fact, Imtiaz is somebody who's worked very closely on the GSLV rocket, the PSLV rocket. Those are the cornerstones of uh, ISRO at this stage. Uh, he's worked on variants of these rockets, which was used for the Chandrayaan mission. The Chandrayaan mission uh, has been such a remarkable success to think that it was an Indian mission uh, through which the detection of water on the lunar surface uh, was made feasible. Um, you know, these are things that we need to talk about, but it's also a huge uh, competition. It's a huge challenge. There are enormous budgets, and there are technology hurdles which need to be overcome over a period of time. Now, from all of, for all of us over here in India, the fact that we've got Indian engineers, Indian scientists, Indian visionaries, um, and an Indian idea really propelling this is what is truly inspirational. So, uh, Imtiaz, um, just a broad introduction over there. Wonderful to have you, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Vishnu, and good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for those kind words, especially uh, for the organization uh, for which I'm working. And I guess uh, the organization is the one you know, which has enabled me to reach this place. Today I'm sitting in front of Mr. Vishnu, whom like, we, we've grown up watching him on TV, and we, we watch his debates, we watch. So I guess there's nothing special. It's just that, you know, yeah. It's the organization that I'm working for that has enabled me to reach here and sit in front of him. So, uh, like, uh, I, 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 uh, as he said, I started my career uh, with Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. I'm, I'm essentially a chemical engineer, and right now I'm at ISRO headquarters here as in charge of the Directorate of Human Space Program. So, in my, you know, humble capacity, I would like to first uh, take you to the Gaganyan program. I have a few slides here. Can I start straight away? In the late 60s, ISRO was formed in 1972. The Department of Space was created independently. But our space program was mostly looking at you know, solving the societal problems. So we were not into uh, the sort of uh, arms race that the other countries, the, the advanced space faring nations were into. And we did well in terms of, uh, so in terms of trying to use space for solving the problems of man and society. But that is not the topic that I'm talking about today. Today, I'm here to talk about something extra. I'm, talk I'm here talking about innovation, space exploration. So I'll just touch upon few missions. I'm not going to details of the rocket development, the satellite development, and things like that. Today, uh, in terms of the launch vehicle, we are ready. We have uh, sort of tested uh, the propulsion stages, the cryogenic stage, the liquid stage, solid booster, uh, S200 stage. We have conducted static tests and uh, qualification tests for these. So number of tests are to be carried to see off all the off-nominal situations. So those tests have been carried. And apart from this, the crew escape system motors, there are uh, five motors in the crew escape system, the high altitude escape motor, the crew jettisoning motor, low altitude escape motor, the uh, low pitch motor, high pitch motor. All these have been static tested, so they are qualified. The crew module propulsion system has been qualified. The service module propulsion system has been qualified. The parachutes, uh, rail, track, rail track rocket sledge deployment tests have been carried out in Chandigarh, and uh, integrated main parachute tests have also been carried out. The next series of deceleration tests have to be done on the test vehicle and integrated airdrop tests, where you will use a helicopter to take uh, the crew module to a particular height and drop it uh, with deployment of parachutes. So these are uh, the further testing that is required, and we are planning to you know, start the integrated airdrop tests and test vehicle missions uh, maybe as early as uh, June, July this year, 
it's because the crew module has been realized uh, and the other systems are getting ready. So we'll be starting these testings and what we intend to have is perhaps the first unmanned flight. There will be two unmanned flights before going to the crewed flight. So the first unmanned flight will be most likely early next year uh, in 24 and then we will have the next unmanned flight also next year. Following after that, uh, depending on the data, uh, you know, what are the corrections required and things like that, we will go for the crewed flight. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, all of that. We really look forward to uh, this mission when it does blast off. There's still a way away in terms of a lot more uh, in, uh, in terms of testing and all. But I think, uh, you know, we, we use the, the, f the words human space flight for a reason, right? Um, it's not a manned mission necessarily. And we can expect Indian women in space as well, right? Is that something that we can expect in the first mission or subsequent missions? So uh, for the first mission, uh, I think uh, it will be one of the four uh, test pilots that we've selected because it involves a lot of training and they have already undergone the first phase of generic training at GCTC and then mission specific training. They've completed almost uh, one and a half years of training with us here. And there is another almost one year of training remaining for them. But for the follow on missions, because Gaganyan will not be a one off mission. Uh, the government has sort of given us uh, an approval for a sustained human space flight program and it makes sense because the kind of benefit that you expect from a human space flight program, it needs to have longer duration stay in microgravity and it needs to go further, like you need to uh, develop technologies such as rendezvous, docking, perhaps someday you need to look at inflatable habitats. We are also having discussions with uh, you know, other space agencies whether uh, we can dock to some of the existing space stations. So those are all possibilities once you establish your own uh, you know, human space flight program. So definitely uh, in the follow-on missions, you will have more of uh, non-pilot uh, sort of uh, people flying in. It, co it would be more generic. Uh, we intend to have more astronaut selection. We're drawing up the criteria for that. So perhaps in the follow-on missions, you will have more generic people. There will be women. There will be uh, you know, civilians from non-defense background. There will be scientists. There will be doctors. Because that is how uh, you see the, uh, the countries which have the space program. People are drawn from all those areas. And off late, if you've noticed, even the age is not a very sort of strict criteria today. People as old as 70 years have flown in space. And 50 kind of thing is very normal now. So it's not a very strict thing. As long as you're fit, you're agile, you're able to understand the procedures, you work well on the simulators during the training session, I think you can fly. And our uh, astronauts are called Vyomnauts, is that right? Is that official now? No. So there are a few things uh, like, you know, the term that we use for astronauts, uh, the names of the astronauts. So those are things we are uh, we're holding it tight. We will uh, sort of announce at uh, an opportune moment because that's for the government to do. Perhaps uh, the time would be right when we've accomplished at least the first uncrewed mission. And that is when uh, we will be announcing the sort of term that we use for our astronauts and the names and things like that. So at this stage, we, uh, we But we there will be names. There will be names, specific uh, to yes. our uh, sensibilities and yes. interests. That's yes. interesting. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, qualifying uh, the capsule itself to sustain uh, human beings on board, obviously safety is of the your highest priority. What are some of the technology hurdles you've encountered? So one of the... So, uh, as I said during my presentation, we had the launch vehicle, so that was less of a problem for us. So the launch vehicle was done. But uh, we coming from a satellite sort of uh, background to a module where you need to carry human beings in orbit, the first and foremost thing required was the environment control and life support system. We hadn't done it. So you know, uh, you need to budget everything for that. So uh, we didn't know, like, for example, as to how much oxygen we breathe during the 24 hours. But now we know exactly. We know that it is 0 0.86 kilograms plus minus something of oxygen that we breathe. So the kind of water that a human being needs to drink, the amount of solid foods that we need to, to eat, and, the ki and this has to be balanced. So whatever you eat has to come out. So there has to be budgeting for everything for the sweat, for the carbon dioxide that we release. Everything has to be budgeted. 
and when you are intending to give a short sleeve environment you should be worried about not just the total pressure but also worry about the partial pressure of oxygen partial pressure of carbon dioxide sometimes increasing the partial pressure of carbon dioxide can be more dangerous mm -hmm. and uh, in a similar way you know reduction in pressure can also be dangerous so all these aspects when uh, we were designing we uh, sort of understood that there is a large network of systems see we we are born on earth uh, for generations we have been living on earth so our body has got adapted to earth's conditions but to recreate those inside a crew module is not so easy so you need to have a temperature and humidity control system you need to have a cabin pressure control system then you have need to have an air revitalization system because the humidity needs to keep you need to keep removing carbon dioxide you need to keep removing and you to to control all these networks there has to be a controller so this is one of the challenges then when we come to specific human use products like you need to have a space suit you need to have space food you need to have an emergency survival kit so there is a vast range of products that are required all these we had to start from scratch because we hadn't uh, sort of worked on these technologies before 3 day mission or 3 day plus mission and it's a small it's a uh, spacecraft it is uh, what would our astronauts be doing on board? They wouldn't have very much space to actually be moving around. Would they be bound to their to their seats through the entire mission? Yes, for most part of the mission, they will be bound to the seats, and the seats will not be more like this. Like seats would be sort of you know reclined position. They will be lying uh, down most of the time, but there will be tasks that they will be uh, required to do. For example, if the uh, the the cartridge for the air revitalization system needs to be changed so they will have to but it will be accessible to them so they will have to change it they will have to work on the console to go through the different pages to know where they are uh, and what is the next mission sequence so there is a wh whole sort of procedure document which minute by minute they have to carry so those are called as flight procedure just like the normal aircraft that we have pilots have a task here also they have a task defined throughout the mission then if there are problems like you know let's say a fuse goes off or some power system malfunctioning then they they are trained to do those kind of replacements as well so that is also a responsibility that the crew has on them the in the previous missions conducted by other countries there have been many off nominal situations the advantage we have coming late into it is we can learn from all of them so when we say off nominal or unknown unknowns i think those unknown unso unknowns in our terms will be still less because we would have learned from those experiences but still there can be unknown unknown unknowns for which we will have to give the crew some sort of uh, rights and autonomy to abort the mission and uh, begin their journey back home so that will be an important task so they have to be agile you cannot have suppose you have two crew on board they both cannot go to sleep one of them has to all be always awake so that's the sort of responsibility they have and ultimately uh, what are we leading up to um, you know with the gaganyaan mission are we going to see an indian space station is that uh, perhaps something we can expect in the future so at this point of time uh, i think it, it is little far fetched because uh, you know we are yet to sort of take the first step which is gaganyaan mission but uh, i would say it's a natural progression uh, you would have more uh, human missions more robotic missions there are several technologies that you would need to establish before going to a space station see uh, i said about the environment control and life support system so but this for a small mission is different but when you talk about a you know long duration sort of space station and all you need to have a regenerative eclss so that's an entirely different technology when you talk of regenerative eclss system and there are many other technologies like the docking rendezvous those kind of things have to be established so we need to go step by step i think uh, the teams are working on various technologies uh, i wouldn't say no because you know uh, other countries like us uh, russia china they uh, they are the ones who are today who have uh, human space program and they have all have uh, at present space stations so perhaps at some stage we might also want to have because the the driving force for any human space mission is not engineering it is science so science will be driving this and ambition right yeah so science the reason i asked that is because and this was my next question uh, why do we need a, a human space flight program when we have wonderful satellites yeah. uh, we have drone technology as well we we you know i mean we planning a, a rover on the moon once again in the future so why do we necessarily need to reinvent the wheel do something which has been done decades back yeah so as i was saying uh, the human space missions will be driven by science 
Now, when we talk about science, uh, it's a new sort of, a uh, lot of new avenues come into play. S uh, one, f the first and foremost is how microgravity and uh, the space environment affects human body, which is, let's say, it's bioastronautics. Those impacts, the physiology, uh, you know, the bones uh, change in length, the muscles become weaker, the eyes have issues. So there are many things, many changes that happen to human body. Now, many of these changes, the doctors would like to study and find uh, sort of uh, solutions to the health problems. Like, for example, one study that uh, you know uh, we, we plan to conduct is with some of these fruit flies. So the fruit flies have some sort of similarity in terms of their kidney with the human kidney. So the stone formation can be studied with uh, you know in microgravity you have more sort of rejections of. Uh, those carb those materials, so stone formation is faster in microgravity. So we want to study that. Drug development becomes very important. Many drugs can be developed in microgravity because here you never get in, uh, when you talk about crystallization, he, there is always gravity present here. So to get uniform size crystals on Earth is very difficult, but in space it's always possible. So space biology will be the next aspect. Then you talk about astrochemistry, you talk about sort of, you know, f the physics, the physical aspects that come in. So there are vo wide range of things that are need to be carried out. Now, uh, even despite so many years of research that other countries have done, if you look at the papers published, it's enormous literature, but we are still scratching at the surface. There are a large number of things that are required to be done. The second thing is the technology. When you have the technology, you think of interplanetary missions, and now there is talk going about space tourism. People are talking about suborbital flights. Then there is talk about human, you know, humans going to other planetary bodies and trying to uh, do mining. People are talking about mining in the sea, but the space mining is a reality today. There are com there are companies like uh, Deep Spacing and Planetary Resources who have got clear cut, you know, plans to go to a particular asteroid which is made of platinum and do mining and bring back platinum. Then there are, let's say, Moon has got high helium-3 reserves, which can be fuel for future. So many of these planetary bodies have got such mineral deposits, which can be harnessed. So those are other objectives for a human spaceflight mission. Imtiaz, it's been fantastic talking to you. We are out of time for this particular Thank session. Pleasure. Um, and I think uh, you know the audience over here completely appreciated uh, you know this candid, candid conversation. ISRO is genuinely um, a source of pride for all of us. You know, your vision, your achievement, um, your, the, the missions themselves, and the fact that there is so much for the future. Um, and the fact that you inspire an entire generation of youngsters in this country, um, the fact that you encourage um, you know, people of all backgrounds, the fact that so many of the engineers and the scientists come from small villages, regional engineering colleges, uh, and then have risen to the very highest levels. Uh, I think uh, the ISRO story is, in a sense, the India story. And we didn't get around to talking about the people who actually um, are at the heart of ISRO, which is what ISRO is all about. But it's a genuinely inspirational story of, of the best of what India can offer through Indian education systems. Uh, and you know, India and, and what it wishes in terms of its ambitions in an area which just a few countries around the world have dominated. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Vishnu. It was an absolute pleasure in talking with you. And thanks to the organizers for having me here. Thank you very much.